Okay, this is um, EENG360 VHDL, and this is Lab 5, Part 2. In Part 1, we talked about the D flip-flop, and um, we showed that we had three blocks of code corresponding to figure 4-2 in your text, and uh, the next state equation for a D flip-flop was just that Q next equals to D um, when it's enabled. Otherwise, it's just equal to its uh, old value, current value. Well, for the JK flip-flop, you do the same thing. So over here, I've got um, I got my D, JK, and T, and then each one has a corresponding test bench file. So let's open up the JK flip-flop. And you'll notice on the JK flip-flop, you know, it um, has our libraries. We have our entity. What kind of things do you have in a JK flip-flop entity? Well, you got a clock. you got a reset, asynchronous. You have an enable, synchronous. Then you have inputs J and K, and then the output of the flip-flop is Q. And then, of course, Q changes on a leading edge of the clock. Okay. Well, then you go down to your architecture block, and once again, you notice you have your three blocks. You have your transition block, you have your next state equation, and then you have your output. Well, the transition from next to current hasn't changed. That's identical to what you did in the D flip-flop. You just take your next value of your flip-flop or your state and put it into current. If you have an asynchronous reset, you reset it to zero. If you don't have an asynchronous reset but you have a clock event, you need to check to see whether it's a positive edge or a negative edge. Uh, if it's a positive edge, clock will equal one, in which case you'll take the next value of the flip-flop and put it into the current value. The next value was determined down here by this concurrent conditional signal assignment statement. Right? Well, in class we showed that the next state of a flip-flop or the characteristic equation, the next state is a function of inputs and current state. And the characteristic equation for a uh, flip-flop is the next value of Q is equal to J ended with Q prime or K prime ended with Q. And you do that by setting up a truth table on J, K, and Q <coughs> and solving for the next value of Q. Okay, we did that in class. Well, here's J ended with Q prime ORD with K prime ended with Q when it's enabled. If it's not enabled, you just leave the current value for the next value. So when it gets clocked, the next value gets updated with the updated to the current, but they're the same, so nothing changes. And then here, uh, your output is typically a function of your state and inputs. But here, uh, current reg is my state, so I'll just output there, and then Q is uh, equal to uh, one of my output vari my output variable in my entity. Okay. So it's the exact same thing. Nothing has changed between this and the D flip-flop except this equation right there. It's that you use the characteristic equation of the flip-flop. All right. Now at that point, let's see. Um, let's go to our test bench file. Now here on the test bench file, okay, once again you have your libraries and packages, empty entity block. You have um, the component that you're going to use. Flip-flop, JK flip-flop, say 87, VHDL 87. Here's all the variables in this file prefixed by a TB. I've already set up the TB. And then TBQ. And then here's your clock period. Make sure you use 100 nanoseconds, otherwise your picture is not going to look like mine. And then uh, <coughs> here you instantiating it using VHDL 87 format. <coughs> and then similarly, you have a process, a clock process. Notice there's no sensitivity list here, which means it just goes continually over and over and over. And uh, you're setting the clock to zero, waiting half a clock period, setting it to one, waiting for another clock period. Uh, what's TB clock? Well, TB clock is a variable you declared here in your uh, test bench, and it got mapped to the clock that's driving the flip-flop. Okay? So there you just generated a continuous clock forever and ever. This process goes forever and ever. Now what we want to do, instead of doing what we did in the JK flip-flop where we used a for loop to check on the value of the loop variable i, let's do something different. Let's set up a process for each input. There's a process for my J input. Here's a process for my K input. Here's a process for my reset input. And here's a process for my enable input. Okay? And then down here is my stimulus process. I just wait 1,000 nanoseconds, and then I terminate the simulation. Okay. All right, let's go look at the J process. What am I going to do for J? Well, you notice none of these guys have a sensitivity list, which might lead you to believe that this process is just going to execute over and over and over. But will it really? No. What's going to happen is when the simulation starts, this process will execute. It'll wait 240 nanoseconds, and it'll set J equal to 1. And then it'll wait indefinitely. 
Well, that's okay. It can wait indefinitely because down here in the stimulus process is where I assert it after um, 1,000 nanoseconds. Okay, so I'm just setting J. It's going to stay there until this process, the stimulus process, terminates things. Okay. Well, what's happening on the K process? On the K process, it'll start once the simulation starts, and it'll wait 140 nanoseconds, set K to 1, wait 100, set K to 0, wait 100, set K to 1, and then it'll wait indefinitely. So this kind of gives me a way of just focusing on the variable at hand. This guy right here sets up the J values I want. This guy right here sets up the K values I want. And then reset, I want the reset line to be asserted after 740 nanoseconds, and then wait indefinitely. The enable, I want to enable this flip-flop after 20 nanoseconds, and then wait indefinitely. Now if you go look at the lab, those numbers correspond to what I want you to, um, what you, the kind of figure I want you to get. But the point to take away from here is how many processes do we have now? We've got a clock, which is 1, J, which is 2, K process, which is 3, reset, which is 4, an enable process, which is 5, and a stimulus process, which is 6. So this test bench file actually has 6 processes. All right. Now let's see, everything looks synced up. Let's go ahead and simulate this guy. And it'll make it easier for you to actually get custom waveforms if you want to test particular situations. Okay, it's crunching away here. Okay, looks like the simulation completed successfully. Now the simulation application ought to come up and give me some waveforms. Okay. Oh, would it come up? There it is right there. Okay, so let's uh let's zoom to view, zoom to full view. Um there's your clock. I like my clocks up top. We could put, um, let's see, what does the lab look like? I want it to match the lab. Let's see, the lab had the clock up top, and then it had, when it had the clock, and then it had J, and then it had K, and then it had reset, enable, and Q. Okay, so it matches the lab. All right, now notice clock period. That's constant value. We don't really care about that. I can right click and delete that guy, get it off of there, and then zoom to full view. And now that pretty much looks like wha what I wanted you to get. On the first clock edge, what's happening? J is 0, K is 0, right there and there. Reset is deasserted. Enable is asserted. So what happens when you have J and K and you clock a JK flip-flop? Well, Q stays the same. Stays the same. It was 0, it's still 0. Okay, now here on the next clock, notice I've changed K to 1. Okay, so now I've got 0 to 1 and... Um, uh, it's enabled to reset, and now I'm going to reset it. Well, it was a zero. It gets reset to zero. Now, look right here. This is not actually good. This should probably be back more because you need to set this maybe on the negative edge of the clock. You're setting it too close to the positive edge. Yeah, that's not good. Okay, so I need to modify the simulation. But then on the next clock edge, what do you have? You have J1, K0. All right, that says set it. So when that clock edge happens, we go from zero to one. Okay? And then on the next one, we have J1, K1, and that's the toggle mode. It is a 1, it's going to toggle to 0. And then right here, J is 1, K is 1, toggle mode, Q goes from 0 to 1. Uh, J1, K1, toggle mode goes from 1 to 0. So we're in the toggle mode right here. Every time we get a clock, we toggle. Now, something happens right here before our next clock. We assert reset, which causes that output to go low before a clock happens. Well, that's an asynchronous reset. Okay? Um, it doesn't depend on the clock. And then now, even though we're still in the toggle mode, we're trying to toggle the flip-flop, but because the reset line is asserted, nothing happens at the flip-flop. All right? Okay, that ends uh, part two. There won't be a part three because um, all you have to do is figure out the characteristic equation for the T flip-flop and change that one line of code. All right? Okay. Thanks for watching. See you later.